Good morning. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation event, part of the series of events that we at Resolution Foundation have been running on Corona Comics. Challenges facing policy and government is the issue today. And we're delighted to be joined by two excellent speakers. We'll hear first from Sir Ivor Crew, the former Master of University College Oxford, President of the Academy of Social Sciences, who of course has written widely on governments and the blunders of our governments uh, and on public opinion and party politics. Uh, and after we hear from Sir Ivor, we'll then turn to Jill Rutter, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government. It's great that Jill is joining us as a commentator. Jill and I joined the Treasury at the same time many years ago as officials. And Jill has had a great career in the civil service, including Treasury and Number 10 and DEFRA since then. Um, as you know from these events, we often try to get our audience to give a reaction on key questions which we put. And I'm just gonna hope you'll see on the screen now a question on which we very much hope for your reactions and I'll give the response probably after Jill has spoken. This is after nine months of dealing with the crisis, um, we're gonna give you a range of options about what has been most impressive in the way that the government has handled it. I hope that the question, the range of options will be available on your screens in a moment, but you're invited to tick whether it's the vaccination process or the uh, mass testing, there are several options available. Now, uh, let us begin by hearing from Ivor Crew. It's, we're very grateful to you, Ivor, for joining us this morning, and we very much look forward to your observations on the policy and governance of the coronavirus crisis. Ivor, over to you. Thank you very much. I think you're currently on mute. I was put, I was- Oh, there we are. We can hear you now. I think you're right now, Ivor. Yes, go for it. Uh, thank you, David. Good. Um, COVID is uh, the most acute challenge to the capacity of the British state to protect the health and security of its citizens since World War II. Other external shocks and emergencies, previous flu epidemics, global financial crises, terrorist attacks, floods, and so on, do not compare in scale or impact on people's day-to-day -day lives or indeed the national economy. But they have given the state experience of disaster management, uh, where I think the state uh, since World War II has been fairly successful and indeed possibly underestimated. We won't know for many years, for example, how many terrorist and cyber attacks have been prevented by the security services. But by international standards, the government's handling of the pandemic has been tragically poor, at least so far. 60,000 lives and rising have been lost, many unnecessarily. The UK's fatality rate per 100,000 population is among the highest in the OECD. Uh, whose most recent economic report forecasts a sharper decline in output this year and a shallower recovery next year than almost any other OECD member. And that is assuming that there will be a post-Brexit trade deal. The one mitigating feature is employment, which has been better protected here than in many other countries. I think the contributory causes of the high fatality rates are now well known, so I shall just uh, list them pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, quickly. The absence of a clearly articulated and sustained evidence-based strategy from the start, the delay to the first lockdown in March preceded by super spreader large gatherings, the acute shortage of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment in hospitals and care homes in the early months and the chaotic provision of supplies, the offloading of infected patients from hospitals to unshielded care homes, the failure to apply an effective uh, test tracing and isolation program, TTI, uh, in February and March, when the low number of infections was still containable. The delay to the second lockdown in the autumn, contrary to scientific advice, 
the failure to use the suppression of infections during the first lockdown to establish an effective TTI system for the mass population and the gradual erosion of public compliance with government directives um, for managing the pandemic. But there have been some successes too, notably, the rapid launch of the furlough scheme for workers and the loans and grant schemes for businesses and the self-employed, the adjustment of universal credit to help job seekers, the development of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and the advanced procurement of plentiful supplies of multiple vaccines, and the agile approval of the Pfizer vaccine by the um, MHRA. So in a year's time, uh, it's possible if max, mass vaccination is rolled out quickly and the economy uh, recovers more rapidly than is currently forecast, it's possible the verdict on the government's performance might be a little kinder. But the pandemic has revealed that the state is not reliably resilient, that is to say, well prepared to weather massive external shocks of which we can confidently expect more in the future, more pandemics and financial crises, more extreme weather, particularly flooding, more cyber attacks, uh, crippling financial systems, energy grids and transport, at least potentially. So what lessons can be learned to make the British state more resilient and governments more effective? Well, here I'm deliberately making a distinction between the state, that is to say the operational infrastructure of public agencies, such as the civil service, local government, the armed forces, emergency services, and so forth, and the government, that is the elected executive accountable to citizens through parliament, who have that state apparatus at their disposal to implement the policy choices they make. What are COVID's future implications for a more resilient state, irrespective of the government's policy choices? And what are its implications for policy making irrespective of the capabilities of the state apparatus. I think those things need to be kept separate. Well, I propose to apply five stress tests for a resilient state. Uh, strategic capability, spare capacity, a sufficiency of trained personnel, effective vertical coordination, and trust-based public compliance. First, strategic capability. In emergencies, governments must make difficult strategic choices involving finely balanced trade-offs with very high stakes, usually in conditions of uncertainty. They can be helped by the expertise of specialists, by the personal exposure of the core executive to major strategic dilemmas in the past, and by the rudiments of what might be called a learning state, that is to say, a state that automatically incorporates the lessons of previous crises, both at home and abroad, into current policy. Now, the government made the strategic mistake of delaying lockdown by a month longer than necessary. This clearly was not for the absence of expert advice through SAGE, the chief scientific advisor, the chief medical officer, and so on. But it appears the rationale for the effective steps taken in a number of countries in the Far East, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, the warnings of the WHO, as well as the evident implications of the rapidly deteriorating situation in Northern Italy, did not appear to register early enough with ministers. The East Asian countries I mentioned had all learned from past pandemics and had ready-made plans for action. We didn't. And none of the ministers most closely involved had been prepared for decisions of this gravity. There are evident steps that can be taken in the future to incorporate more post-mortems, more scenario planning, more awareness of practice abroad to make the UK more of a learning state. But I'm not sure how one arranges for the governing classes, irrespective of party, to be better trained for the tough dilemmas of governing. They are largely recruited from the talking and persuading professions and less and less from local government or the senior cadres of large complex organizations. Spare capacity, by which I mean spare capacity of equipment and facilities. In the early months 
The UK found itself seriously short of COVID-19 tests, which was unavoidable, and the right kind of uh, PPE and ICU beds, which was not. The number of uh, intensive care unit beds per population in the UK is one of the lowest in Europe. There was a cabinet office exercise in 2018 on responding to a potential pandemic, which demonstrates that the state did have the capability to anticipate shortages, but the government chose not to create adequate reserve stocks. That was a political choice. Government laboratories had been consolidated and partly privatized and NHS hospitals under financial pressure were running with narrower margins of bed occupancy and fewer staff and had delayed the purchase of spare PPE in order to balance their budgets. The policy dilemma for public services is whether to adopt just in case provision for emergencies, which requires stockpiling, underused and potentially obsolescent equipment, mothballed facilities, and the supplementary training of staff, or whether to adopt what one might call just-in-time provision, which relies on efficient international supply chains and an entrepreneurial UK private sector, which can meet uh, upsurges of demand at short notice. Just in case provision will be compromised where government is intent on relatively low levels of public expenditure. But as became evident in the early months, international supply chains break down in global pandemics. And with the important exception of the Nightingale hospitals, on which I'll say more shortly, the government mismanaged the rapid procurement of PPE, as the National Audit Office report demonstrates with graphic details of defective contracts, non delivery poor value for money, and so forth. Clearly, measures to ensure in the future more effective procurement of emergency supplies can be put in place. But it does beg the very old question of whether the UK should adopt an industrial strategy of national self-sufficiency in the production of security equipment, materials, and facilities, let alone in food and in energy. Trained personnel. Um, well, thanks to a relatively open immigration system until recently, there have been just about sufficient numbers of medically trained staff and support staff in the hospitals. But initially, there was an acute shortage of testers, tracers, and isolation monitors for a TTI system, and of additional trained medical staff for the Nightingales, had they in fact been used. An effective mass TTI system is an immensely complex logistical and social challenge, which the government has not cracked to this day. Testing capacity has been ramped up sufficiently, but that is only the first step. ONS figures suggest that under 10% of the contacts of the 330,000 newly infected in the first week of November self-isolated. The government decided to bypass the established National Health Service, Public Health England, local authority and university resources, and rely instead on a hastily assembled collection of commercial partners to set up and manage a TTI system under the misleading title NHS Test and Trace. So Deloitte's the auditors around the testing site, Circo, the public services support company, were contracted to recruit 18,000 tracers, Cytec, the project management company, ran the contact centres. And it's been an object lesson in the problems that arise when trying to set up a new and shiny system from the center outside established structures and under immense pressure of time. Problems of poor coordination, the overlapping of roles, unclear lines of accountability, the bypassing of expertise and experience, underused capacity and unintegrated IT systems, um, all, uh, 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 were all obstacles to uh, setting up the system effectively and quickly. The government also relied on the armed forces who designed, built and partly staffed the Nightingale hospitals. And they could also, had it been necessary, have taken over delivery services and supported the police in cases of severe disorder. And there's no doubt that the armed forces do have the capacity, skills and equipment for all of these emergency tasks. But the government was lucky 
Unusually, only 4% of the armed forces were deployed abroad. Their number is down now to 80,000 in the army and 145,000 altogether. What if a much larger proportion of these reduced numbers happened to be on active duty elsewhere and were therefore unavailable? I might add that uh, the UK also has, by international standards, a low police to population ratio. Other countries have a separate dedicated civil defense and emergency services body on whom they can call in crises. The uh, Carabinieri, the National Guard, the Gendarmerie um, are, are amongst examples. But these are paramilitary bodies under central national control. The UK has no equivalent and there would probably be strong political resistance to establishing one. Are there alternatives? Uh, if the armed forces were explicitly given a civil emergencies role, their numbers would have to expand significantly at very substantial expense. A separate non-military civil defense organization dedicated to dealing with emergencies would have nothing to do for much of the time. But perhaps there is scope for fleshing out David Cameron's big society idea, which withered away soon after his election. Civil society is strong in the UK. It is estimated that over 4,000 local mutual aid groups were formed during the lockdown, mainly to support the shielding of the elderly, and that the number of NHS volunteers totaled over 750,000. But relatively few were used because the country lacks a national or regional system for matching volunteers to the tasks required by established organizations. The voluntary sector offers the advantage of local roots, networks, and knowledge. It can reach the nooks and crannies of communities that public agencies miss and address individual needs and circumstances for which social services aren't equipped. The national policy challenge is to create and train a reserve civilian, as distinct from paramilitary, emergency force to support the established emergency services from the large but untapped local voluntary sector. Coordination. The response to national crises always requires central coordination and local administration. The center designs policy and allocates resources. Local agencies are left to deploy resources and adapt policy to local circumstances. The challenge for the resilient state is to create a successful partnership between central and local government based on the right balance of roles and responsibilities. The UK state devolves substantial powers and responsibilities for managing crises to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, as we know, but not to the English regions or metropolitan areas, including London, which covers almost 90% of the UK population. On the contrary, the austerity program has cut local authority resources by 40% in real terms over the last decade and hollowed out many of its traditional services, including its public health and social care functions. COVID-19 laid bare this um, imbalance of central local government relations and the problems it generates for coping with national crises. The government opted for new top-down initiatives from number 10 and central control over enormously complex systems where what was critical was rapid response and local insight. And it bypassed local delivery systems and expertise in favor of large private companies without extensive prior experience or local geographic intelligence, and imposed local lockdowns and allocation to lockdown tiers with little or no prior consultation, thereby creating unnecessary political opposition and public resentment. The failure of TTI, and for example, the kickstart scheme to provide youth employment are lessons to be learned. The future challenge for the resilient state is to create a stronger, better balanced long-term partnership between central and local government, which recognizes the distinctive contribution that adequately resourced and staffed local agencies can make to managing public health and other crises. The critical component of that partnership is the dev devolution of more powers for English regions, perhaps by developing the Northern Powerhouse prototype, which will in turn lead to higher status and better training of senior personnel in local agencies and to more interchange of officials between Whitehall and local government. Well, finally, trust and compliance. At, terms of national, at times of national crisis, the 
resilient state must rely on public compliance with irksome and intrusive rules that disrupt uh, uh, people's livelihoods, freedom and privacy for the greater good. And this in turn relies on public trust in the government's competence and integrity, that is to say, its commitment to the public good as distinct from personal benefit. And this needs to be effectively communicated. The first lockdown ushered in a period of exceptional social solidarity and cooperation, encouraged by the clear message of stay home, save lives, protect the NHS. Polls reported high levels of trust in government competence and intention. But thereafter, public compliance has slowly faded. Significant numbers have uh, ignored government directives or encouragement to undergo testing if suffering from symptoms, to cooperate with tracers, to self-isolate when instructed, to download the COVID-19 app, to avoid large gatherings, to return to work in June, as they were at one time advised to do, or to send their children to school in September. And the reasons appear to include Failure to communicate a clear strategy underlying the various government directives. Failure to communicate the scientific basis for some of the directives. Apparent inconsistencies in the rules and breaches of common sense. Very frequent changes or reversals of policy. Uh, I have a long list that I could go through, but too little time to do it now. Widely published examples of non-compliance by politicians, senior officials, and other public figures, and over-promising but under-delivering. It remains to be seen whether sufficient numbers will sign up for vaccinations to protect society as a whole, but on that I'm optimistic because public trust in medical science is far higher than it is in government competence and integrity. The gradual deterioration of public compliance and trust is the product of political failure, uh, not state malfunction. It arises from politicians' choices of strategy or its absence of specific policies and their presentation uh, of policy and their styles of leadership. We may speculate whether a public decision-making system steeped in the culture that is adversary and campaigning rather than deliberative and exclamatory serves the national interest at times of crisis. And if it doesn't, what, if anything, might be done about it? But that is a discussion for another time. Thank you very much indeed, Ivor. A really challenging assessment of the performance of what we want to see as a resilient state, but you have reminded us of uh, how difficult that has proved in the previous months. Um, just before we turn to Jill, I'm going to call up again, I hope you'll get it successfully on screen share, the questions that we are asking people to comment on. Um, I've already had a mischievous comment on Slido asking if there's a typo and we should, instead of saying which has been most impressive, we should say which has been least unimpressive. But this is all about relativities. This is ranking. So we are very interested to know your assessment. And um, after we've heard from Jill, I will uh, report the outcome of uh, that survey. And of course, do keep your questions coming on Slido and upvote questions which are particularly catching your attention as pertinent. Uh, now, it's fantastic. Jill from Institute of Government, very uh, well experienced in the working of government. Jill, we very much look forward to your comments. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um... David, and thank you very much, Ivor, for that uh, disquisition. Of course, um, Ivor and his collaborator, the late Anthony King, are very well known for blunders of our governments and uh, are no doubt sort of, uh, or Ivor limbering up for a sequel uh, based on the pandemic. Um, at Institute for Government, we have looked at the other side. We've looked at successful policies uh, and produced uh, some things on that, one of the things that's very notable about policy successes is that most policy successes are based on a very effective collaboration between ministers and their official policymakers, and perhaps going beyond that into wider stakeholders. I think that's one of the issues that's been a bit of a problem here on the pandemic. So I'm going to uh, 
uh, go in, whatever, uh, to some, a few comments on what Ivor has just said. But could I say, if you're interested in decision-making the crisis more generally, the Institute for Government, David, it's a for, not an of, uh, has produced a piece by Alex Thomas uh, and Sarah Nixon on uh, decision-making in a crisis, which looks in detail at some of the examples that Iva has just taken us through. So let's just think about this. And I think the really interesting thing here is to see if we can decompose between what is a failure of the state machinery and what is a failure of the political leadership of the state machinery. And I think on quite a lot of Ivor's charges, it's actually the political decision-making that's been a problem rather than the state machinery. I'm exempt from that uh, test and trace, which I think has been a big delivery and implementation failure. I think that's some very interesting questions. But it's quite interesting that actually quite a lot of what Ivor has said goes back to an earlier set of decisions, maybe an issue that we want to raise, not with Ivor or me, but with our very excellent chair uh, the former Conservative Minister, Lord, because a lot of what Ivor has actually been saying was that the effect of the years of austerity, even in the NHS, which of course uh, had more favourable treatment than many other spending programmes, local authorities were very much at the other end and got the very rough end of the stick through all that time, had let, left the UK with a less resilient state than it might otherwise have had. And you can see that. Because actually, if you are a politician in any year being asked to decide between, if you like, jam today in the form of current services or potential jam tomorrow, which you hope will never be used uh, in the shape of building some excess capacity, resilience and whatever, you have to be an incredibly self-denying politician to say, no, I will make the decision that we will have slightly longer waiting times in hospitals. Uh, we will deny a few more services. We will not spend money on expensive drugs or horror of horrors. We will have slightly higher taxes uh, in order to pay for that margin of spare capacity. And that seems to be quite a lot of what uh, Ivor has been saying is actually the net effect of all that uh, cutting away meant that we were running on a bare bone state. And not surprisingly, when you ask a bare bone state to step up, not just remember we spent the four, last four years preparing for Brexit, that actually took quite a big toll on lots of the same people. But when you ask that state to uh, step up to a one in a hundred years pandemic, it's found a bit wanting. I would also point out that although we can beat ourselves to death with comparisons with Germany, and comparisons with Australia and New Zealand, uh, the UK has done quite badly. The OBR exposed that in full Technicolor glory at the time of the Chancellor's uh, spending review statement. But I don't think France, Spain, other countries have necessarily covered themselves with huge amounts more glory. They've all suffered from similar trials and problems, lack of public trust, arguments between uh, more local politicians and central politicians as we have. So there has undoubtedly been a big challenge to many of the uh, Western democracies. Um, the US thinks it's done worse. Um, the US actually head for head has done about the same as the UK or was doing about the same for the UK. But you can also argue some of the underlying factors, you know, if you live in a small densely populated country, things are more likely spread quickly than if you live in a, in a much more rural spread out area and things like that. Uh, if you're much more globally connected, you're likely to get uh, pandemics spreading much more quickly at the start. One reason why I think both London and New York suffered very badly uh, than if you basically have very low levels of connectivity. Those aren't excuses, but I think, uh, yeah, there will be question marks in the future when we get to the inevitable public inquiry about how much worse was the UK's response. So I have a starting point was that we had too little evidence I think Ivor is not right on that, and we were unprepared. Actually, I don't think that stands up uh, to huge amounts of scrutiny. I'm going to make the reverse case. The UK, in a sense, was overprepared. The trouble for the UK was it was overprepared for the wrong sort of pandemic. The National Risk Assessment said that, yes, there was a very likely, high likelihood of a high impact event, but that was a flu pandemic. And one of the troubles, 
was that the people advising the government, the scientists here, who I think do need to be brought into the frame, uh, took too long to realize that actually what they had dismissed in the national risk assessment of something which would actually be dealt with in East Asia, another SARS-like virus where they thought the worst case was a replication of Toronto's experience of SARS with 250 deaths, um, was actually wrong. It took them some time to switch from the pandemic flu mode, which has very different ways of responding to a SARS-like pandemic. And I think you could also argue that although politicians undoubtedly delayed, and this is where I think we have to look at political decision-making, the scientists were in a sense waiting for more evidence. One of the things that we know was, and Lawrence Friedman's done a fantastic deconstruction of a lot of the uh, sage minutes, is that people were waiting for evidence to emerge before they took what really were unthinkable draconian actions. And in a sense, we're waiting for the numbers to come through with a lag rather than what other countries did and just looked at Italy and thought, Christ, that could happen here, we'd better act. So there was a bit almost of a sense that the lumbering structures that had been sent up partially in response to the foot and mouth response and other things were actually too over elaborate. The network of SAGE and all its committees actually almost gave us a bit of evidence paralysis. There's a suggestion that actually in a sort of fight or flight, the UK thought it could be much cleverer than it could be. Remember all those initial statements from Chris Whitty about the time's not quite right yet to up the level of our response. We thought we could manage this in a really sort of precision targeted way when actually some of the countries that did better straight away were those that just thought we don't know, we're scared, we'll, uh, we'll close down. Uh, I think that then plays in to the fact we had People like David aren't in the cabinet. You know, the nation's lost. We have an incredibly inexperienced cabinet. Remember this government effectively, the chancellor just reshuffled his cabinet. He'd made some sort of critical job changes in February, but even those who'd been appointed were only appointed at the end of July. And partly because of the selection bias within the Johnson cabinet and the Brexit loyalty test. I think you could say that a number of the more experienced conservative uh, cabinet members were not available or not chosen by the Prime Minister, partly because some were no longer in the party, partly because some were on the back benches. Uh, and so there's a dearth of really experienced ministers there. Um, if we then look to the other sort of issues, I think of Iva's list, it's really interesting to decompose that list into which were political failures and which were state failures. I think the one, if we say there's an earlier failure about the failure to invest, the, best, the political decision of the failure to invest in uh, resilience, I think the more acute current failure was the failure to get the test and trace scheme up and running. Now, one of the things we can't tell from outside was how much this was driven by political decisions for example, on the famous app, the decision to go for a special UK only one. Throughout this, there was always a sense from ministers that the UK could and should do it better rather than free ride on what other people were doing. That may or may not be their political agenda or it might be based on some evidence. We haven't seen that. But I think the halting, uh, the halting rollout of test and trace does show that the UK state does still struggle with what we've always known they've struggled with, which is translating policy ideas into proper end-to-end -end process implementation. And that is clearly a thing that needs to be addressed and was a very big problem. But Ivor also said there was a big problem around lack of trust. And I think that's hard to lay at the door of the state apparatus, as opposed to at the door of the politicians and many of the decisions that they made. Uh, what characterized the political response to the pandemic was a repeat refusal. Prime Minister on a few times he'd use the words, I'm going to level with the British public. But I think many people have said that an inexperienced prime minister 
whose chief selling point is his ability to be really optimistic and write a good column is not necessarily the person to give hard truths. And throughout the political messaging was what we're doing will be world beating when actually just good enough would have been nice. Um, and we will lead the way on these things. But also this will soon be over. The prime minister promised we'd have the virus beaten within 12 weeks. A lot of the scientists stood on the podiums with him and looked quite askance when he said that. He was the person urging us to get out, get back into our offices to save pret manger through the summer. Uh, there seemed to be a real serious failure uh, to think through the implications of schools returning, uh, the impacts of that on test and trace, a failure to think through the consequences of refusing, in a sense, to bail out universities for moving all their studies online as far as possible during this year. And I think what you got was a government that struggled to think beyond the next week and to struggle beyond the next press conference. Now, is that the fault of the civil service or is it the fault of ministers? It's probably the fault of both, but I would just point to the environment that the government decided to create with the civil service. One of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of the government throughout this year has been a repeated narrative of civil service failure, of people of not being good enough, of people who are standing in the way of reform, and civil servants looking around have seen a number of their colleagues uh, being asked to stand down what might uh, politely be called a bit earlier than maybe they thought, uh, and various other people being told that actually their names are on a list to go. I think where the pandemic response has worked well is where ministers have actually been able to establish very good working relationships with their civil servants. And I think that is a key part of actually the success, and hopefully this has come out top of your poll, of the Treasury and HMRC. Indeed, one of the slightly surprising features of the response to the pandemic, I know I was terrified when those Treasury HMRC schemes went live, that loads of people might be asking for money, but that it wouldn't get out. Uh, David and I have been there, done that from our time at the Treasury. The Treasury is not a great implementation department or that universal credit would fall over. Universal credit has been the sort of slightly surprising unsung hero of the pandemic. But I think if you create an environment where you are making it clear that you have an underlying agenda of hostility to the serving permanent civil service, that's not an environment that's necessarily conducive to the necessary honest conversations that are a hallmark of the best policy making and are essential to a policy response. Would devolution have made it better? Well, possibly, but actually, if you look now, the place where infection rates are rising the most is Wales. Wales took a very distinctive path in terms of going for its circuit breaker lockdown. It's a really interesting natural experiment of whether Keir Starmer's advocacy of the SAGE recommendation in September of a quick lockdown and then a release would actually have been more effective than the strategy the government was belatedly forced into. Uh, so I think that's a very interesting thing to come. It's not clear to me that would necessarily be better. Is there queue for sorting out better though our screwed up relationship with our big cities? Yes, indeed. The sight of government ministers arguing with Andy Burnham was absolutely in nobody's interests and was very bad. And ministers have to realize that now they've, uh, suffering from, to an extent, a self-inflicted trust deficit. They need to recruit allies wherever they possibly can. And I think that's going to be vital if we're going to have a successful vaccine rollout. So I think the verdict is possibly more mixed than either, either gives it credit for, uh, but I think it's not a happy verdict on the UK. We'll have to wait for the public inquiry to get the full laying of blame. But I think what we have seen is a failure both of politics and of implementation. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Jill, for those very uh, pertinent comments. And uh, you offered your assessment and 
critique. Let's just see if we can sum up on the screen now the reactions to our survey of participants to find out what um, you guys all think of what area has the government's response been most impressive uh, and ties up ties in very much with what Jill was saying the income support for that. <laughs> get the uh, get the strongest support um, with uh, almost half of people endorsing them uh, and then quite an even balance between NHS and uh, responses outside Whitehall and very little support for the public health campaign but that very much ties in with uh, Jill's observation um, and uh, if I may also pick up on a couple of things Jill said, I'm going to rise to her challenge about whether this uh, state's uh, limited capacity is because of the years of austerity uh, in coalition when I was in the cabinet and have to take my share of responsibility. And I think I would say on that, it's something we've analysed subsequently at resolution. Um, although one can talk about a bare bones government, as Jill did, in reality, however intense and ideological the British political debate, it's about public spending being 45% of GDP or 40% of GDP, and it moves around in that range. When we look at it at Resolution Foundation, what is striking is where the priorities are, the shape of the state. And the UK is very unusual in having such a very big healthcare sector, very relevant for what we're talking about now, and to some extent, a very large transfer payments. So we're an unusually shaped state. I might almost add with my intergenerational preoccupations, a state aimed very much at delivering money and services to older people. It's all the rest of the state that is shrunken. So it's, a, it's got a rather unusual shape compared with a classic OECD state. But anyway, that's something that we can touch on further. Um, but uh, let's now look at the questions coming in. And the one that's been most upvoted is from John Bartle. And I, so I will highlight that. Uh, and this is, has the UK's adversarial party system uh, Oh, no, this is a different question than the one I was going to raise, but uh, let us go with this one. Yeah, let's go for the one that, sorry, let's get this right. The one that I am trying to highlight uh, is uh, this one. Yeah, has the UK's adversarial party system slowed government's responsiveness, and is it that the Conservatives have been reluctant to follow Starmer's lead? So perhaps... Uh, let's start with Jill and then we'll go to Ivor. We, you've talked, Jill, about party issues, political issues as distinct from operational state issues. Within the political issues, is party politics part of the problem? Actually, on this, I'm not convinced. I do think it is part of the problem on this, though clearly the most interesting thing, I think, um, and again, David, you may have views on this, is the descent into um, factionalism of the Conservative Party and the emergence of these uh, research groups who don't seem to be desperately big on research, but the, oh, I think it's actually not even a research group, is it the COVID recovery group, is the Prime Minister having to look behind at his own backbenches. I think for the most part, actually, I don't think Labour has been desperately adversarial on this, it's been critical about the government's competence. And I think actually it, that's, uh, that's its job, actually. I think that's right. It's quite interesting though to raise this issue because in a separate place and uh, extraordinarily controversially, as we discover on Twitter, Arnon Menon and I at UK and a Changing Europe have been suggesting that our adversarial party politics is one reason why we may be about to be heading to a Brexit that doesn't necessarily command majority public support, certainly didn't command majority parliamentary support in the parliaments of uh, 2015 to 2017 or 2017 to 2019, may, may not head, have majority support in the parliament of 2019 onwards. And to an extent that is because our system doesn't have a particularly good way of taking a nuanced balanced result and converting it into something that is a uh, you know is a compromise as opposed to polarizing 
to an extreme, one extreme or the other. But I don't think the case in, of COVID is that is that's quite true. I think it's I think you may find though a bit of this. I think may lie in the character of the government. This, as I said, as an ex, an experienced government, but it is also a government. And we saw this, though I'm not sure if he's taking it terribly seriously himself. As it's most extreme in Gavin Williamson's comments about why did we approve the vaccine first, which had most of us, possibly including his erstwhile colleague, cringing, um, that actually Britain had to do this better. And the more the evidence came through that we weren't, the bigger the claims had to be that Britain actually was totally exceptional and beating the world. Um, and I think that actually probably informed the response more than our adversarial party politics. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, Ivor, your observations on that. Yes, well, I very, um, I very largely agree with what, with what Jill has said. I don't think that adversarial uh, politics has, um, has influenced the debate about the rights uh, uh, policies and strategy in COVID as much as it might have done, not least because the Labour opposition has uh, opted generally to uh, uh, to uh, avoid making uh, party political capital um, out of uh, the um, uh, out of some of the things that have gone gone wrong or some of the disappointments so far um, in in attempts to manage the crisis. But in another sense, I think what one might call the style of adversarial politics or the tradition of adversarial politics has. Um, influence the way in which the government um, has uh, uh, presented its uh, policies on COVID in ways that, in fact, Jill has already, has already uh, illustrated. Uh, you know, to what extent were the press conferences um, uh, exercises in educating and informing the public? And to what extent you know, were they um, attempts to uh, spin the, gov the, the government's uh, record uh, in the best possible light. Well, um, I think there, there, there were elements of spin, too many elements of spin uh, in, those, in, uh, uh, in those press conferences. And also in parliamentary exchanges um, uh, on COVID, uh, you know, Boris, Boris Johnson is a, is a, is a campaigner. And um, uh, he didn't, he has not put political campaigning aside, I think, in the way he has presented the government's, uh, 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 the government's case. And this has, in, this has actually, I think, infected uh, the people's perceptions of, uh, uh, of uh, his and the government's uh, uh, exhortations um, on best practice in relation to COVID. So just to give you an example, uh, the Prime Minister could not resist um, uh, responding to fairly sober criticism from Keir Starmer in Parliament by describing Keir Starmer as Captain Hindsight. Well, it, it, I mean, it's, a, it's a very small, it's a very small, it's a very small example, but I, the government, has, particularly the Prime Minister, I think has found it difficult to move away from this kind of ding, from this ding dong approach to uh, what is a grave national crisis. Yeah, thank you very much, Ivor. Now, we were going to test the wisdom of the participants further by hoping to ask a second question for you to poll on, which I hope we can get up on screen share now. Um, so this is uh, about the handling of the crisis uh, and whether it's, uh, you can see what, it, if you think it's made the case for different responses, more technocracy, more democracy and more devolution. So do give your reactions on that and we'll get the, give you the result towards the end of our discussion. And let me, let's just stick with that final option there, more devolution. Because looking through the questions that are coming in on Slido, there's a strand of questions about devolution. Have some of the devolved administrations done better? Are we over 
centralized? Have we got the right balance of power between UK government and not just devolved administrations, but also local government? Ivor, you, you touched on that. Um, any, any observations further on, on just how much, what, the, what this says about devolution and where it might go next? Well, I think as Jill rightly pointed out, um, there's not much evidence so far that any of the devolved administrations has had a, um, a markedly better record in managing the COVID crisis than in um, England. Uh, the figures are, are not very different in Scotland from, uh, um, from England and Scotland has taken a very independent line on the right, on, 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 on the right strategy. The main difference between Scotland in England is that the leadership in Scotland appears to be much more popular than the leadership in, in, in England and there is a greater trust in, um, in it by the Scottish population and that might, that, that actually might be related to things other than COVID-19, 19, 19 of course. Uh, but I do think that, uh, and I say this as a rather late convert to devolution of powers to uh, to either regions or to major, major metropolitan uh, hubs. Uh, but I, 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 I do think that COVID-19 has laid bare the problems that arise um, if uh, number 10 takes initiatives and tries to take highly centralized control of what inevitably are going to be very complex, logistically complex uh, programs. Uh, and uh, I'd be very interested in, in Jill's view as to uh, why she thinks the government decided to bypass uh, not only local uh, councils, but, um, uh, but other local uh, agencies, um, uh, including universities and government research laboratories uh, um, and, and so on, for, for example, the creation of an of a effective TTI system. And indeed, why, why was Public Health England um, sidelined in trying to establish a, a, a TTI agency? Now, was this, was this again, a, effectively a, a political decision reflecting um, a bias, a, a, an, an assumption that the private sector will always do these things better, or was it based on a realistic analysis of what local government and other local agencies were capable of? Uh, thanks uh, very much. Jill, your observations? So, uh, yeah, I think where the devolves are clearly, uh, I think I'd put Northern Ireland as an exception, because we know that this has posed enormous strain on the fledgling executive there. But I think where the devolves have outscored the British government is undoubtedly on the communication and the trust. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's really interesting the extent to which um, many people who would never have heard of Mark Drakeford before, probably, possibly including people in Wales, have now, uh, now come, to, <laughs> come to recognize some of these things. And I think it has actually educated people uh, about the extent of the devolved settlements in the UK in quite an interesting way. So I think the devolves have communicated better, and that's key. Nicola Sturgeon is a very, very good media performer. Um, we know that, and she's proved that there and, uh, and been able to adopt a much better tone in many ways. Why do ministers go for the centralised option? We can't really know. I, I remember Public Health England was very much in the doghouse over the failure to sort of, you know, have enough tests available. Public Health England has been, you know, on the sort of scapegoaty step throughout this as a failing organization. Indeed, one of the bizarrest decisions was Matt Hancock in August, deciding that the middle of a pandemic was the right time to restructure Public Health England uh, and merge it with Test and Trace into this new National Institute of Public Health and Dido Harding could get stuck into that as well as trying to get tests and trace working. Uh, you would have thought that was a very bizarre set of decisions to be making in the middle of a pandemic, even if in the long run it's the right structure. Um, very courageous minister. Um, I think why centralized? 
Well, actually, if you're there and you're slightly panicking, it's probably easier to sign a big contract with a bunch of consultants who say they can deliver it for you than it is to negotiate through this extraordinarily complex web of local government. You know that local government capacity is very different and stretched all over the place. We've actually just seen Croydon Council go bust. We know we've had to take over Northampton and stuff like that. I mean, we could say Manchester could do it, but actually, you know, are we as convinced that the rest of local government could do it? I think that's always one of the fears of ministers about devolving is then they won't get the credit when a local government, local government does it seamlessly brilliantly. They will pick up the flat for every failing local government and our structure of local government is really not fit for purpose for these sorts of tasks. Um, so you've got sort of quangos you've, you've already lost trust in, meeting local government that you don't know, you're pretty skeptical about in many circumstances, whatever. Or you've got consultants who might you might say also are over promising and under delivering who offer to take that problem off your plate. And you can sort of see why in the heat of the moment you might decide that is the easier way to go. Uh, so I think it's a bit of an understandable reflex. Um, but I think one of the things that we've seen throughout, and I think this is a really interesting question about decision-making. I noticed you had on your list, David, stronger cabinet decision-making. You bizarrely didn't have more women involved in decision-making. And quite a lot of people are saying, actually, is this the time when basically the biggest correlate to a successful response is women in women leadership? I do think the cabinet has suffered inordinately from a lack of diversity in the people around the decision-making table. We've talked a lot about women being at the sharp end of quite a lot of decisions. I've always thought, actually, you didn't need to bring Keir Starmer to the cabinet table. But I think quite a lot of what the government did might have been a hell of a lot better if they'd seen fit to involve Angela Rayner and Jess Phillips and some of the people who might actually have a bit more of experience of what was it like to live in a small flat with kids and stuff like that. And I think the government really has suffered from a bit of, uh, this is our life, we can manage, we can do this. Uh, and it would have been better to have more what NAFLI is called diversity of lived experience around the cabinet table. And I think that actually would have been one of the ways in which involving some of the devolves would have actually given them new insights. I think they should have established a sort of COBRA style oversight committee much more regularly, not just taking the view that the Scots always cause problems and suspended COBRA for quite a long time, but involve both the devolved administrations and some of the big local leaders into that to actually uh, really, really have the views going in both ways, not just can you help us out in doing this, but actually what's it like on the ground where you live? Because it is very different depending on structures of the economy, uh, structures of housing, tenure, etc. Thank you very much. Jo. And I think you're making a really important distinction between the devolved administrations, Wales and Scotland, and local government within England. Uh, I remember a conversation with Margaret Thatcher when Liverpool was in terrible difficulties, arguing that, you know, people of Liverpool had elected militants to run Liverpool, Liverpool should be left to it. To which Margaret Thatcher replied, if Liverpool gets into real difficulties, we, the British government, will be blamed for it. I cannot sit in my hands and let it happen. Um, and that is still, I think, the political dynamic to this day. Now, I'm, there's, a, there's a question addressed to you, Jill, although I'm also going to ask Ivor to comment, which <laughs> <I> is <dare. laughs> about the public inquiry, which you said was inevitable. Um, what is the best way of doing that public inquiry? Uh, and uh, the uh, we, people would be very, I think people would be interested to hear your yeah. views on that. And I'm going to add a little angle, a little twist to it, mm. because Thinking back to my time as science minister and my continued conversations with the science community, there's a bit of anxiety that we would regard ourselves as being world leaders in science. And you could argue some of the vaccine work has shown that. We're also regarded ourselves as world leaders in risk planning and contingency planning, but we've ended up with one of the weaker national responses. So does this tell us that even some of our prized assets have been underperforming? So, Jill, 
what, how should we do a public inquiry and what should it look into? And then we'll turn to Ivor. Uh, well, this is where I need to refer you to other colleagues at the Institute for Government who've done quite a lot of work on this. So my colleagues, Emma Norris and Marcus Shepherd, have put out, uh, put out some thinking on that. I think there are two different sorts of public inquiry. Um, do we need a full sort of, you know, Chilcot style thing now? For God's sake, no, not in the middle of a pandemic. We don't want everybody to spend their entire life going through the back files, um, working out who said what to whom when. That, I think, will inevitably come down the line. Mind you, I always thought that about Brexit until we had COVID. I think uh, COVID has probably saved people from the Brexit public inquiry that we might have had. So I think at some point we ought to do some exercise like that. But hopefully uh, it can be sort of a bit more productive and take less long than Chilcot plus lawyers and stuff like that. Hopefully what the government at least has done is do the sort of thing that I think sort of Bird of Jenkin and, and two others have been calling for. It's a very rapid, at least internal lessons learned inquiry to actually just work out what went well and what didn't go so well. But the trouble is to do that requires something that I think this government is, uh, is probably its biggest weak spot entirely. I'm just not sure this is a very self-reflecting government. Um, Ivor referred to the learning state. And I'm just not sure that we have people sitting around the cabinet table who are very open to evidence, very open to facts, very open to thinking. Could we have done it a bit differently? And I think for that exercise to be valuable, uh, that is the sort of mindset you need to have done. One of the things I would say on this, and I think this is where ministers have actually really slightly lost the plot, is the public has, yeah, yeah, was prepared to cut them a huge amount of slack. The public is not stupid. They realise that this is a massive ask of any government. It's really, really, really difficult. I mean, I think David and I have referred to the initial huge amounts of solidarity that we had in phase one. But I think ministers have, through their actions, managed to dissipate that on an absolutely amazing scale, um, which, uh, you know, and they seem to almost be on a mission to dissipate, which I find very weird. And I think if they had a bit more capacity to think a bit more inclusively and to reflect and not descend into some of the sort of slightly petty tribalism uh, that Ivor was mentioning, they would find themselves in a better and more credible place emerging as nation national leaders, not just as sort of factional leaders. Uh, thank you very much, Jill. Ivor, your observations on a public inquiry and are you willing to chair it for us? <laughs> you, chair it. you chair it, David. <laughs> Or Jill, indeed. Very fair point. I want, to, I want to chair the Brexit one, so anyway. But, uh... Well, I, I, I don't have much to add to what Jill has said. I, I think I agree with, 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 with everything that she said. I, I do think that a more resilient uh, state uh, would, uh, would incorporate mechanisms uh, for um, evaluating what went right and, and, and wrong um, uh, and for um, and then for taking those evaluations seriously and incorporating them into you know, planning, planning for the future. I, doubt, I think there are ways of doing that. I doubt if it can be done by a big public inquiry, which um, precisely because it would be a public, uh, a public inquiry would take a very long time um, and uh, would be inevitably uh, treated as political by by the government from the very start, rather than as a matter of good administration or good, or good governance. Uh, there's probably quite a lot, and again, Jill will know more about this than, than I, there's probably quite a lot that the civil service could do to um, quietly uh, reflect on what went uh, well and what went badly and how, uh, and how uh, policy and implementation could be uh, improved next time. Uh, I, I, I worry that the civil service is 
uh, has much shorter institutional memory than, uh, uh, than, than it used to, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and you, one does need institutions with, institu with an institutional uh, memory to, uh, uh, to uh, benefit and take advantage of the um, evaluations that it, uh, that it uh, uh, commissions. But if there is to be an inquiry, it, uh, and it is a public inquiry, I, it, should, it should have a deadline. It should take no longer than a, than a year to report, and it should not have uh, it should not have politicians as its members. Thank you very much, Ivor. And now, as we're getting towards the end, let's see how the participants <laughs> in Aston have reacted to the second question that we put. So, if we could call that up on the screen now, yes, um, that's interesting. Very. Strong support for technocracy and <laughs> devolution, rather less for cabinet. Um, and this may, uh, this uh, is a very interesting lesson. It may also partly reflect the fact that we are so pleased to have so many participants in our events who are from the civil service, from Bayes, <laughs> cabinet office, from the treasury, from DWP. Uh, and from the devolved administrations. In fact, I work on the basis that every anonymous question on Slido comes from a civil servant, which is fine. We understand the constraints. So uh, that's a very interesting reaction for what people prioritize. Um, I'm now going to invite our two panelists, first Jill and then, then Ivor, uh, to make their final observations on uh, uh, what they take from this. There was one interesting question which I hope you might pick up on, which is okay. very interesting, and that is, are there any lessons for this from how we handle ze uh, climate change moving to a zero carbon economy? Given that that, let's imagine a world post-COVID and post-Brexit, it is going to be COP26 and all that. Are there any lessons here for how we get on with the green agenda? I think we'd be interested in your observations on that. Uh, and of course, as we have uh, just had such a ringing endorsement of the capacity of the civil service, any observations about where civil service reform might go with after virus and after the departure of Dominic Cummings? Uh, Jill first. Okay, wow. Uh, there's a very excellent IFG report on net zero by me and others, um, which I can highly commend as uh, uh, suggesting things. And I think one of the interesting things is are there lessons for, for net zero? Of course, those of us that have in the past worked in government on climate change have been deeply frustrated that a while, that while I remember getting somebody when I was working for David Miliband way back at DEFRA, getting one of my colleagues to write a piece about if climate change is really is a greater threat than terrorism, why has the government moved heaven and earth on terrorism and done virtually nothing on climate change? And one of the things that COVID shows again is that acute crises provoke a very different state response to chronic long-term crises, even if people think the end effects are, uh, are much more severe. Um, but what I would say on net zero is I think that the big lesson for the government to take out is that Net zero is not just about rhetoric. You can set a world beating net zero target, be the first country to put into law that you'll be net zero by 2050, but you've got to do it. And I think the thing we'll be looking over with the government in the year and the run up to the COP, which now has incredible momentum with the US presidency and with um, China, both you know, on board as far as we can see, um, is that the government needs to back up its rhetoric with credible worked through deliverable plans. So that's my big lesson, big lesson on that. What about the civil service reform? Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm not gonna to talk too much about civil service reform. I actually think the government's civil service reform agenda is quite dull and mundane in the sense of the agenda that Michael Gove set out in his famed Ditchy lecture, that's not an official Institute for Government view, that's a Jill Rutter personal view, I have to say, because actually we've heard lots of those things before um, about dispersing civil servants, uh, about upping skills, commercial skills, quite a lot's been done, more still to be done, but we'll see whether that will make a big difference. 
valuing expertise more. But could I just make a reference to the sort of trajectory? We started COVID with the public villain number one being Public Health England, and it's now on the chopping block um, for being the people who hung on desperately to a monopoly on testing capacity, were very reluctant to share, sluggish, frankly, a bit useless, chief executives chopped, you know, focus wrong place, blah, blah, blah. The fact that they actually were completely fulfilling their mandate from ministers, let's just discard that. But the heroes of this week are undoubtedly MHRA, uh, the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency. Why do we trust the fact that the vaccine in the UK has been approved quicker than anywhere else? Not because we trust Matt Hancock or Boris Johnson, but because Dr. June Rain looks like just the nice, friendly, competent technocrat that we are prepared to put our faith in and say, if it's good enough for June, it's probably good enough for us. And I think that is one of the things that ministers might want to take out of that, that actually undermining your advisors is actually a short-term tactic. Uh, actually value your technical advisors even when like Jonathan Van Tam, another man who's had a bit of a rehabilitation, they say quite inconvenient things about your advisors. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, Iva, your final observations. Uh, well, uh, uh, just a few. Um, first of all, um, I think that uh, the, the, uh, COVID-19 uh, establishes uh, that uh, experts and science are highly valuable to government and should be uh, uh, and uh, should be trusted. But politicians need to understand the nature of scientific uh, um, advice uh, uh, and the fact that there is there isn't always a scientific uh, uh, consensus. Um, I think it's notable how uh, very few uh, government ministers have got any background in science at all in this, uh, in this country. I read recently that uh, on one occasion when Angela Merkel was meeting uh, leaders of the lender in Germany to discuss uh, uh, some public uh, health policy uh, dilemmas, she started off by saying, I have ran the model myself and come to the following conclusion. I don't think any, any uh, government minister could uh, um, uh, could uh, do that. Um, secondly, I um, I have been puzzling about you know do we do we have do we have a a a a, a political system and a political culture that can plan long term and can find a way of agreeing to uh, spare capacity, um, or is it inevitable? that um, control of public expenditure will always, um, will, 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 will always lead to too little provision for, uh, uh, for spare capacity. I, 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 I wasn't, I didn't hear, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear anything that made me optimistic from, from, from Jill about that. Thirdly, um, and I'm sorry that we didn't have a bit more time to go into this. Um, will there be a time when, uh, when ministers do not take it for granted that the private sector is bound to be more efficient than the public sector? I am still really puzzled as to why it, it is thought that asking a firm of auditors like Deloitte's to run the test and trace, to run part of the test and trace system, was regarded as anything other than a very bizarre decision. Um, and um, uh, I, because uh, it does seem to me that uh, there are some very evident advantages in uh, trusting the established public sector to uh, handle. Uh, crises, albeit a uh, public sector that has been uh, that has been reformed and, and modernised. Thank you very much indeed, Ivor. Your final challenges 
uh, of, uh, of public expenditure reminds me of an observation of a former treasury minister at a Resolution Foundation event, which said he thought the brutal political reality was always that public expenditure cuts were easier than tax increases. And uh, who knows, it's a debate we at Resolution Foundation are entering, whether that remains the rational political calculation or not. But we're very grateful to Iva and to Jill for a fantastic and lively debate on this uh, crucial set of issues arising from the virus. Uh, we're grateful to you both. We're also grateful to an organization I should have mentioned at the beginning, the Money, Macro and Finance Society, who are our partners in this series of seminars. Thank you to all our participants and to uh, many of our questioners who, as I suspect, may themselves be civil servants at the sharp end of many of the decisions we've been talking about. Thank you all very much indeed.